if you've uh, realized, but what you're experiencing here is not the physical world. It's um, it's a simulation. I don't think that any subject matter in the world works necessarily for virtual reality. It's not so much how to tell a story, it's how to tell a story and in parallel how to integrate the viewer to that story. And if we find a great story but we do not find a way to really integrate the audience and the experience, we just don't do it because it's not made for virtual reality. There's many ways that the project can come to being. What I often like to think of is what would be an ideal context for a virtual reality experience? What would really formally optimize presence? In the case of Miyubi, we kind of started with this premise of putting the viewer inside the body and mind of a small Japanese toy robot from the 80s. That was a way to be able to really put focus on the viewer while also justifying their limited ability to actually interact with the characters who would be addressing you directly. Miyubi, approach. <laughs> wow, buddy, that is tremendous. So amazing. Yeah. You know what? I have a great idea. How about when I'm in Japan, I get a friend from you? But he doesn't need a friend. He's got me. It's part of our craft as uh, immersive filmmakers to actually tell good stories, but also to find a way to really create a sense of presence for audiences. And, and that trickles down to a question of craft. If I think about Traveling While Black, for example, the initial intent was to explore how the reality of traveling in America for African Americans has evolved over the past few decades, going back all the way to the days of the Green Book, which was this guide that was uh, created for African Americans to travel safely and find safe places. We didn't necessarily know how to do that from a present standpoint at the beginning. But then working with uh, the creator of this uh, called Roger Russ Williams, we started to think about trying to find a location that was featured in the Green Book originally that was still in existence today. And that we could maybe immerse the viewer inside of one location and use that location as a, as a time traveling device. That's a continuous thing that hasn't changed since the beginning of the relationship that exists here between blacks and whites in the United States. It's like a river that keeps flowing and we don't really see all of it, but at the end of the day, it's something that started back in slavery and continues today. Transforming that location the way it looked 50 years ago and translating from the past to the present and staging conversations between people who are uh, regulars at that place and having the viewers sit at the table with that community through those different eras and hearing those conversations and suddenly it all kind of started to, to make sense. But had we not figured out that sort of core central idea, I don't think that that project would have been good for virtual reality. You get far enough into the future and the difference between reality and what's virtual is just going to get narrower, narrower, narrower. If all your senses perceive it to be as real as the real thing, even though you know it's not the real thing, at some, at some point it just becomes a, a trick of the mind of like, all right, just suspend your disbelief the same as you would do when you watch a movie and you're in Rome. It's actually even more interesting, I find, to think not of, of a virtual Rome, but a virtual place that couldn't exist in the real world. Rome is made for human beings living on Earth with the physics of this world, whereas a virtual reality experience could be reinventing all those things, uh, every, every single aspect of what I just said. There are many, many ways of thinking a format that will optimize presence and then exploring ideas beyond that. And sometimes we'll be surprised by, you know, someone coming up with an idea and, and we're like, this is good, you know, this, this is made for VR.